If you demonstrate your Power BI work by telling the audience that you have built 19 visuals, three custom visuals connecting four different data sources, then you've actually lost the battle right at the start. In this video, I'm gonna talk about a four step framework that I call it the lead framework that me and my consulting team at Goodly Insights, we use that framework day in and out to win high value consulting projects and impress our clients. Now, whether you are a consultant, whether you are an employee, this style of thinking and the lead framework is going to tremendously tremendously help you stand out from the rest of the crowd. No further ado, let's start. Step one in the lead framework is landscape. And in the landscape part, we set the business problem and the impact of the problem. And what do I mean by that? A lot of people have somehow come to a notion that just because they know a particular tool, SQL, Power BI, Excel, Python, whatever that is, they have become immensely valuable and hireable for the company. And that is absolutely not true. Just because you've gotten to know how to write some formulas, build some charts, does not make you extremely hireable in the industry unless you solve problems. Now, most people, as a bad example, they're going to talk about that what is the kind of dashboard that they have built what is the kind of charts they have built the kind of data sources the kind of code that they have written and that's not really a good example especially when you're starting out to describe the project that you have done in power bi or whatever tool that matter a good example of setting up the landscape is to set up the problem that you solved the impact that it had and finally the solution that you provided let me give you an example let's just say that if you built a sales dashboard rather than actually talking about the very dashboard itself why don't you first start talking about the problem that it solved for the client. In the sense, you can talk about that initially, before the report of the dashboard was created, the team was actually pulling up data from multiple sources, multiple departments, manually over an email, and that actually took two weeks of time just to consolidate, clean, and prepare the data, and then the insights came in. Which means that the actual insights that we were trying to drive from that dashboard were literally two to three weeks late because of that process of gathering the data, consolidating the data, and cleaning up the data from multiple departments. Now you actually talk about the impact and that problem that I just described costed companies nearly $200,000 or whatever that number is because of the delayed insights, because of the inaction of the company and the company could not act fast enough to replenish the stocks or move the product or move good products into the stores. Whatever that impact is, you talk about that impact. Now at the moment, we've spoken about the problem. We've also spoken about the impact of the problem in the business and we've also quantified that with a number that how big was the problem that you were trying to solve. Next, we talk about the solution that you provided. And you don't yet start talking about the dashboard. You actually talk about just the solution and how did it actually benefit the business. In the sense, you can say that the dashboard that you created was connected with multiple systems that automatically grabbed the data from multiple departments, gathered it, cleaned it, made it into a nice model and delivered the business insights near real time or maybe on demand. Now, this actually helped the business move just in time. They could take a look at the numbers whenever they wanted and they could replenish the stocks. This meant that in the next quarter, when the business was actually reviewing its performance, it realized that it had actually saved $180,000 as compared to losing $200,000 in the last quarter. That is the landscape on which you start building your foundation of talking about the work that you have done in Power BI, not the actual dashboard. If you want to have a bit of context, here is the framework that you can actually follow. First, talk about the context. Then you talk about the problem. Then you talk about the impact of the problem. Then you talk about your solution. And then you talk about the impact of your solution in terms of hours saved, money made, arbitrages that you have identified for the company, or how did your dashboard actually help the company improve its decision making process. That, if you set it up as a first part, which is the landscape, you have set the journey right of talking about the company's problem first, more than what charts did you create. Quick interruption in the video in case you're liking the video so far and you're wondering that how can I learn these skills of writing good DAX, good data modeling, the M language behind Power Query, and all of the nuances of Power BI that makes it work. I have brilliant courses on Power BI, especially the Power Query part, the DAX part, data modeling part, and the M language part. In the courses, I take you from a beginner level and take you to more advanced concepts, try to explain you the logic of how things are working so that you feel confident in applying the learnings to even on your own data sets. Hundreds and hundreds of students have joined my courses and they have benefited a lot. 
In case you're interested, the link for the courses is going to be down in the description of the video. Let's get back to the video. The second stage in the lead framework is the E and E stands for essential. And what I mean by that is the very process of selecting what KPIs to present on the report. And that is super, super essential. The problem that I am seeing is that most people are just dumping random metrics on the real estate or the canvas of the dashboard and calling it like an intelligent dashboard. Now, anybody can do that. I mean, you can have sales by region, sales by customer, sales by this and sales by that and all filled up nicely on the kind of canvas and you can call it a dashboard or you can take a genuine effort in finding out that what are the right metrics or what are the right calculations that I want to track to be able to improve the performance of the business. In the first step, we laid out the problem that what problem are you trying to solve for in the next step, which is like super important and I have not seen enough people talk about it is that how do you even come up with the right number to track so that you're able to attack the problem and probably even solve it. A good KPI selection process actually, in my opinion, follows three-step approach and that's what I particularly do. The first thing that we do typically is that we help the customers define the North Star metric. The one thing that they're trying to improve in the business and what is the number if they keep on tracking that will help them improve that North Star metric. The one thing that you're trying to improve, one or two at the max. The next comes is that what are the drivers of that North Star metric? It cannot just be the one thing that thing is obviously driven by other metrics and then comes the diagnostics metrics and I'll explain to you all of the three in just a second let's just say that you're trying to work with a SaaS company and the SaaS company is trying to improve the North Star metric that means trying to grow the revenue and for a SaaS company the North Star metric could be the MRR monthly recurring revenue and that is the only metric that the CEO wants to track month on month on month that is part one number two is when you come down to the second level you have drivers of that metric that means if you want to improve the MRR, which is monthly recurring revenue of a SaaS company, what are the drivers of that? And there could be three key drivers of the North Star metric of the revenue. One is that, have you expanded the revenue? That means if you have multiple tiers of subscription of the product, did the customers move that you have existing from a low tiered pricing level to a higher tier pricing level, which is where you're just expanding the revenue. The same customer is now paying you more every single month. So that is expansion of the revenue. The second one is the new customers. Are you acquiring enough new customers or not? And these two things are going to give you that how much of your MRR is increasing just because you have expanded the revenue and then just because you have acquired new customers. One more additional thing in the growth driver could be something that could pull you down, which is your churn rate. That means how fast or how frequently are the customers moving away or signing off from your product or service. And that's nothing but the churn rate. Now, if you track these three, these three are the drivers or the levers that you can actually pull to take a look at your North Star metric. At the moment, note that we are just defining what metrics to track. We're not even concerned about how the dashboard is going to look like. We're just defining what are the key numbers that we would like to track in our dashboard. Finally, we come to diagnostics. We go a level deeper and take a look at all the drivers and take a look at all the metrics that are going to affect these drivers of the business. And these could be at the lower level, at the managerial level or at the analyst level, and they could actually track these metrics. So for example, the new customers is going to be affected by your marketing strategy or your advertising strategy or your conversion rates and that could be a metric that you would want to track for churn it could be the frequency of the use or the complaints that you're getting those could be the two things that we could actually track in churn metrics in expansion revenue you could probably track the usage of the product how frequently the customers are using it and they are hitting a wall which is where your software is trying to ask them to move on to the next level of the product so all of these metrics are nothing but diagnostic metrics they're going to help you understand that what is moving the business in terms of driving driver and the drivers then lead up to the North Star metric. This is a nice way in which you can actually lay out the metrics from the most important ones to then the first level, which are your drivers, then to the next level, which are your diagnostic metrics. There is a very interesting validation framework that you can follow if you want to understand that this metric is useful for the business or not. The first question that you can ask the business leader is that if this number that you're tracking changes, what decisions would you make differently if the number had changed? And if the business is not able to answer that question, then they are actually tracking it as a vanity metric. Next, if they are able to answer that question, then you can ask another question to make the metric even more valuable. Is that what could I add and give context along with 
this metric to make it even more actionable for you. And that's how you solidify the value of the metric that you're calculating. This is a super important step. And I have seen a lot of companies, analysts and business people not doing it enough just to identify what numbers to track in this process. In the lead framework, then comes the third step, which is A, and that stands for architecture. That means how did you actually build the solution in whatever tool? Let's just say Power BI. Are you are just a pretty blabbing face that just talks about things? Or can you actually go down in the dirt? Can you get your hands dirty? And can you build something useful for the company or not? And this is the part that decides that. Mostly the mistake that people actually make is that they just start talking about the solution. I used calculate, a calculate table, I created queries, and I built a star schema, and I reduced the model optimization, all of all of that. The problem is that your solution is your solution, and the client doesn't understand about the context in which it, it was built and the problems that you actually solved. And a good way of actually talking about the architecture that you have chosen is to talk about the context first, and then how did you solve the problem? Like the actual problem that you were facing, in which you made the decision, and what did you do technically to be able to solve the problem? Let me help you understand. Let's just say that the data is humongous, and the model is slowing down. So what you do is you first describe the context of the problem. That means the data was really large, the visuals were slow, the model was becoming heavier, and we had to deal with that. Then you talk about that what did you do to identify the problem? So you said that, hey, I was just trying to take a look at the way decisions are being made from that data. And I was taking a look at that people only take a look at the last two years to make decisions, several decisions, maybe 90% of the decisions. So we built a rolling model rather than actually having all seven years of data. We actually built a rolling model that only captures the first two most recent years of data, puts that in the model, summarizes it, and then we, do, we did the calculations only on top of that. The result being the model became faster, the refreshes became faster, and the visuals started to load a lot faster. This explaining of the concept or the context first, and then talking about the problem is going to give a lot of understanding as to the problem that you solved, why did you solve that particular problem? To make it a little more robust, here is the framework that you can actually follow to talk about your architectural design process. The very first thing that you can talk about while talking about the architecture is give the context. In what context business problem did you actually solve the problem? That is part one. And you can talk about it. You can lay down the basic things around that. And then you move on to the next point, which is options considered. To be able to solve that problem, what are the three or four options that you consider? And why did you choose any particular solutions? The trade-offs that you made, the things that you chose to give away and the things that you chose to keep is a very vital part of the decision-making process is going to actually highlight your technical abilities. And finally, also talk about the result. That means because that you have implemented that particular solution, how did the business or the dashboard or that very technical report that you have created improved and helped the business further? Now, this is a technical session and you have not to be scared about talking about the technicalities or the formulas and things that you used. But before you just deep dive into the technicalities and the coding and that kind of stuff, please lay the context first and then you talk about the problem and and then you talk about how did you actually solve that. In the lead framework, we have come to the last part, which is design, and it is super, super, super important. Now, the problem is that most people start thinking and talking about design when they are doing the work first. That means the very first thing when they're trying to create a business report and solve a business problem is that they're going to think that what color and what shadow is my card visual going to have? Now, that level of shallow thinking is not going to get you anywhere because I have been with enough CEOs to realize that the CEO doesn't give a fine damn about the color of the chart that you have used. He's actually obsessively trying to move the business forward and get the numbers or the information in his hand that is going to help him do that. Whether that's a table, that's a card visual that has the shade or the shadow or not, the CEO doesn't care. Yes, it needs to be presentable enough that it looks nice and readable and all of all of that. But please keep the design process in the end. Think about the problem. Think about the KPIs and the metrics first before you actually come to the design process. Please note one of the mantra that I personally follow is that the design actually follows the content and the problem, not the other way around. Because if you start thinking about design first, you will obviously hit shallow questions about color and style and font. These are very shallow questions at the onset to think about it. Now, personally, when I'm working with the design, I personally try to follow the crap principle. And it's very, very straightforward. And this is going to help you tremendously. In the crap principle, the first thing is contrast. When somebody takes a look at your dashboard, by the contrast, by by contrast, I mean to say that you have actively chosen to display certain things in a certain different way, a bigger font or different font style, that they're actually standing out on the dashboard. And that's a conscious design choice because you want the user to put their eyes and pay attention to that number. That is the meaning of contrast. And it should not be 
because of design, it should actually because of the intent that you want the user to focus on that particular number. Things like uh, choosing to put a red color or choosing to put uh, something in bigger font, all of that are examples of contrast. That's one. In the second thing, when you talk about the crap principle, R stands for repetition. Now, repetition is super, super important. Let's just say that in the dashboard, if you have highlight a bad number with the red color, the next time you can't start to highlight that with orange color or pink color. Although even though orange and pink are also bright contrasting colors, but you don't decorate the dashboard because you want to decorate the dashboard, you repeat the patterns over and over again. This helps the user understand that there is consistency in the dashboard and things are just being repeated all across in the dashboard. It gives a cohesive look to the dashboard. That's the meaning of repetition. The third one, which is super, super important and a lot of people somehow miss that is alignment. Just because you have aligned things really well on the dashboard, your dashboards will massively improve in terms of a look and feel and presentability. Now that a lot of people miss out. There are a lot of tools in Power BI to be able to do that. And that is super important. The last one, which is very important is proximity. By proximity, I mean to say is that things that relate to one another should be kept together so that they can be seen and worked with in the same place. To give you an example, let's just say that you're trying to build a slicer and the slicer affects one single chart. Now, if you keep that slicer somewhere on the top or somewhere at the bottom, the user has no understanding that this particular slicer, which relates to this particular chart, is proximate and it only works with that particular chart. This is something that I feel a lot of dashboards are lacking, that you have to keep related things proximate to one another. Simple crap principle is going to tremendously improve on your dashboards as well. In the end, I just want to say that one thing is that your Power BI skills are tool specific skills and you just don't want to demonstrate that how well do you know the tool. You, it's like saying that I know the calculator really well, but I can't do simple math, actually do the calculations of your business and improve the business. That's not what business leaders are looking for. They are looking for strategic business decisions. They are looking for insights that are possible through a tool because the tool is a better way of doing it. So rather than actually focusing on the tool, you actually focus on the problems that you have solved using the tool and you will be far better off in any kind of endeavor that you're making, whether be it a consulting work, be it a training work, be it working in a company as an analyst or whatever that might be. If you like this video, then my next video on how to structurally learn Power BI really well is going to be one of the epic videos that you would want to watch the next. I'll see you in that one. Cheers.